Hello AP Biology. Uh, in this activity we are going to look closely at the complexities associated with DNA replication. First I wanted to refresh our memory of the anatomy of a nucleotide and uh, some language you're going to hear in this activity. Alright so here we're looking at a, a nucleotide. Uh, let me pull up a quick laser pointer here. We've got our nitrogenous base over here uh, and then it's attached to a sugar and a phosphate group. <clears throat> and so the uh, sugar and the phosphate make up what's called the backbone uh, or the long end of like the, the DNA strand. And then these nitrogenous bases ultimately make up like the ladder rungs or the sideways steps that connect uh, with, within the DNA itself. All right, so the language I wanted to point out, you're gonna hear a lot about five prime and three prime. What does that mean? Researchers gave the carbons uh, on the deoxyribose sugar a number like a like a street address so that we can all kind of talk in the same jargon and, and make sense of uh, which carbon which direction uh, we're referring to so in the deoxyribose sugar there's an oxygen uh, in the middle of the ring and then when if we kind of think of that as like 12 o'clock on the dial and you look to the right clockwise this vertice remember if there's nothing listed here then we assume that that's a carbon and so this is going to be carbon number one. And then they moved along clockwise, called this carbon number two, carbon number three, four. And the fifth carbon actually branches above the <coughs> ring. Uh, and then the fifth carbon attaches to the phosphate group. So they called this the five prime end of the uh, nucleotide. And then uh, you're going to hear about the three prime end, and that's right down here. So let's take a look how this all connects. So. We were here just a minute ago. Here's the three prime end and the five prime end, and here's the phosphate group. And so the phosphate of this nucleotide connects with the next nucleotide at its three prime end. And then moving along, here's the next five prime carbon attached to the phosphate and into a three prime carbon, five to three. And so um, in the end, we're going to say that this this end is called the five prime end of the um, sugar phosphate backbone and this is the three prime end of the sugar phosphate backbone and then here are those nuclear uh, or the nitrogenous bases that branch across. Alright now when we go up a level you see here that DNA is a double helix and so the polymer is built uh, not only lengthwise along this carbon uh, or the sugar phosphate end but also there's another strand that is in kind of a mirror or reverse uh, direction of it. So notice that the five prime, prime end on this one is pointing this direction and this one's three prime end is uh, reciprocal of it. And then here are those nitrogenous bases A to T and C to G. They're held together by these hydrogen bonds which aren't the strongest bonds. They're not certainly not as strong as like a covalent bond. And so we're gonna learn that they can be unzipped easily uh, especially like for like DNA replication or in some of the other um, tenants uh, surrounding DNA, like DNA transcription, which we'll learn about in the coming days. Now, scientists love to use models to be able to help visualize uh, the arrangements, things like atoms and the bonds and so forth. And so we're kind of at a zoomed in model here, and then this is the space filling model that gives you more of a three-dimensional look at it. And you can see that double helix has it like spirals around like a uh, spiral staircase. And then here are those nitrogenous bases or the ladder rungs and then the backbone, the sugar phosphate repeating backbone that you see on, on these twisting outside edges. All right, three hypotheses, early hypotheses about how DNA replicated itself. First, we had the semi-conservative model. And so the question at the time was, uh, you know, how's the DNA passed on to the daughter cells? Like, let's say when you were following it along in mitosis. So one hypothesis was that uh, one strand is passed on to one daughter cell in its entirety, and then a replica is made, as represented here by the blue. And the other daughter cell would receive one whole strand, in it, and of course it would have then uh, formed a, a reciprocal replica. That would be after the first replication cycle. And then imagine these cells grow up and then go undergo another round of mitosis. And so you could imagine tracking that parental strand uh, and then the, the copied strands and so forth in these uh, four daughter cells. Another hypothesis was maybe it's, uh, this is termed the conservative model, maybe the parental DNA is just completely copied and passed on to one daughter cell and, and the entire original parental DNA ends up um, moving along this route 
uh, and so forth. And finally, a third hypothesis, probably the most uh, complex or abstract one of the three, is called the dispersive model. Maybe chunks of the parental DNA ends up in one, followed by chunks of replicated DNA, and so forth and so on. Um, and so you can see how like kind of like there are opposite chunks from one to the next cell. I think it's uh, important to pause for a minute and consider the outcomes of these three models. In a semi-conservative model, there are going to basically be two cells after two rounds of replication that still have a considerable amount of that like parental DNA in them, and then two uh, cells that do not. So it would be like a 50-50. In a conservative model, you would have one cell that would have all that parental DNA and three that would not. Finally, in a dispersive model, all four cells would have some amount of that parental DNA. All right, so there's a ten tendency in uh, science that typically the easiest or the simplest explanation probably is the one that's going to win out. This dispersive model was certainly the most kind of complex, and we're going to find that that uh, was not supported by the evidence. What was supported? Well, uh, an experiment was done where um, bacteria were cultured or were allowed to thrive in a medium with um, nitrogen that had heavy isotopes. And so they're marked N15 because they have one extra neutron in each of the nitrogen atoms. And that extra neutron or those heavier isotopes makes them uh, traceable. Think of them as like slightly radioactive and you can follow them along and locate them and where they end up in the daughter cells and so forth. So um, after the bacteria is cultured for a while, they took some of the bacterial cells and then placed them into a medium with normal nitrogen or the lighter isotope. And they tracked where some of those heavier isotope nucleotides ended up in, uh, in future cells, in the daughter cells. So after rounds of, think of it as mitosis or binary fission, where the DNA is replicating and being passed on to daughter cells, they're able to separate out those cells and look for evidence. So the conservative model, there was no evidence for that. They did not find like an abundance of cells with no nitrogen 15 and only some with complete nitrogen 15. Same with the dispersive model. They didn't find like little bits in every one of the um, remaining daughter cells. What they did find is the semi-conservative model where um, they found half of the uh, daughter cells after two rounds of replication did not have any of the uh, heavier isotope N15 in the nucleotides, and half did. And so this experimental evidence uh, supported that semi-conservative model. All right, curious, what's going on here? Uh, what you see is a, a strand of DNA under a microscope, but the strand of DNA, is something a, a funny kind of appears. Look at, closely at these arrows pointing at what looks to be like a bubble here and another bubble here and another bubble here uh, within the DNA. So this is in the synthesis phase of cell life cycle where DNA is being replicated. And what we find is, you know, if DNA of a particular chromosome was uh, replicated from the left side of the chromosome all the way to the right, uh, just one set of nucleotides at a time, it would take forever. What we find is DNA actually starts replicating from the inside out. Um, and so if you look at these points of the, the DNA strands here, here, and here, these replication bubbles start from within. And so the dark blue represents the parental DNA, and the light blue represents the newly synthesized um, DNA. And as these bubbles extend further and further, as the uh, DNA replication continues, eventually the bubbles bud into each other, and you end up with two daughter DNA molecules. There's the parental DNA, and then there is the newly formed DNA. So this is uh, supporting that semi-conservative model. Okay, so now that we have that background, we're going to get into the objective of this lesson, the DNA replication activity. Here are some brief directions to look over, and uh, here's access to a simulation. When you click on this, now this site uses a program called Adobe Flash Player uh, to run the simulation. Adobe Flash Player does not work on iPads or on iPhones. Uh, but it does work on Chromebooks and um, Macs, and it should work on PCs as well. However, if your browser doesn't have Adobe Flash enabled, you might need to change some settings. I'm currently in Chrome, and it says Adobe Flash Player is blocked. In the Chrome browser, if you come up to the little menu bar and look over on the right-hand side, there is a little jigsaw puzzle piece. I can click on it, and I can manage 
<clears throat> and so I can turn this on, but it does say your flash settings will be kept until you quit Chrome. So I would essentially need to quit Chrome. Let's try this again. Now it says, notice the message change. It said click to enable Adobe Flash Player. And so now I'm going to choose allow and then things get started. DNA replication is the process whereby an entire double... I'm going to pause that for just a brief minute. <clears throat> so um, just be sure to read your, your screen carefully. Uh, different browsers will have that little pop-up menu up here in different places. Firefox sometimes has a little uh, line or a ribbon show up right across the top. Sometimes Safari has a little pop-up box right in the center. If you're having trouble with Firefox, try it in Chrome or, or whatnot. Now if your uh, device doesn't play... Uh, flash player at all. Uh, you can click here for an alternative. I've got a little video you can watch uh, that will let you see what the simulation shows us. Alright, back to the simulation. In this activity I highly recommend that you work through the entire simulation, work through all the little quizzes that pop up and so forth. The quizzes are just practice, just for fun, and they will reteach you if you make something, uh, make a mistake. After you go through the entire simulation, uh, sections 1 through 8, uh, then you can come back and complete the DNA replica replication activity here. To complete the DNA replication activity, you'll need to do File, Make a Copy, and then you'll be able to edit the slide. In the DNA replication activity, there are some still images on these slides. Uh, on each of these slides, there is a full list of vocabulary terms, but you will not use all of those vocab terms on each slide. So on this slide, after watching the simulation and going through the entire thing, um, I want you to choose the words that um, are appropriate to what you see happening here in the still image. I know that helicase is involved, and so I'm going to bring that one out. You can choose to delete the rest of the vocab terms that aren't appropriate for this image after you've selected uh, one or more. Maybe there, I will give you a hint. There's, I think, three on uh, this particular view. Uh, vocab terms you could bring in. Now <laughs> after you pull the vocab term in I want you to uh, add some anecdotal notes here so add your own study notes. So imagine you're making your own study guide for the process of DNA replication. You can then reshape the size of the box so that you can see all of your notes. Continue on to the next available slides. Again only using the vocabulary terms that are appropriate for the image at the time. Others can just be deleted or removed from the slide. If you choose, you can print this from home and preserve it in your binder as a study tool. Uh, you can store this in your drive as an electronic study tool, but uh, I'd like a copy of it too. And so uh, to submit this, please choose the file download as PDF, and then you're gonna turn it into Blackboard under the area that says DNA replication activity. I do want to re-emphasize it's very important that you go through the entire simulation first, all eight sections, prior to moving on to the vocabulary annotation activity. Having done this numerous times with students in a face-to-face -face setting, it works best again to go through the entire thing. Think of it as a close read. Do the first read to, uh, to gather comprehension, and then the second read you go through and start answering questions. And if you need a third time, you can go back and review uh, for particulars that you uh, or sections that you might be struggling with. Uh, this whole activity should take about 30 to 35 minutes, I would say, uh, to finish the Google Doc and have done the simulation. All right, good luck. As always, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email or check in with our tutoring times.